Hello, hello, hello. Laura, hello Graham. Hello. It was really nice to have you just before <laughs> us. Very interesting conversation. Thank, Thank you, you, Laura. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. And uh, I see that now we have reached nine hours and 30 minutes. So, and I'm going to call two uh, designers, uh, Vikenti uh, Griaznov uh, from uh, St. Petersburg and uh, Anna Kolina, who is also from St. Petersburg, but now uh, lives uh, in Helsinki. Um, I'm really pleased to have you on board uh, on this virtual stage because we cannot really speak about theater but uh, it's live and uh, that makes the difference maybe between other uh, videos that we can see on the web and uh, to take part in it is really uh, interesting. Vikenti is an associate professor in the oldest academy of art and design of St. Petersburg but he studied uh, in France in Strat College. He studied uh, transportation and luxury design and Actually, I realized that he's a watch designer also, uh, which is really nice for this event about time and time zones, 24 hours around the planet, uh, to speak about uh, the future of this period and how designers can act and what are also their preoccupations and worries. Uh, Vikenti chose a word to quest and a paradig paradigm, which is communication. And this is why I asked Anna Colina, who introduced me to Vikenti, to come also because she's a, a graphic. I knew her as a young graphic and uh, uh, ser service or interior designer uh, of the Polytechnic of St. Petersburg. Uh, she came to Milan also uh, after she had hosted me in St. Petersburg to visit the, the, the city. And uh, she took part, took part in, a, in a workshop with students of uh, the Polytechnic. And since then, we've known and then kept in contact. Uh, I know that she's now uh, doing her doctoral studies in Alto uh, at Helsinki. And um, she's also senior service designer at the Futurist uh, Agency. So um, I thought it was nice to have her around uh, to have this conversation. But the first question will be to Vikenti. Why did you choose communication as a keyword since you are a product designer? Uh, yeah, but actually, uh, you know, I'm a teacher in uh, Design Academy. And, um, you know, during these uh, Zoom sessions, uh, we understood that the physical communication became vital for many people and for me, really, really. And sometimes sitting nearby my students and maybe just a glance, uh, dropping a glance on my student and keeping silence is making more sense just than just sitting and looking into the camera because I cannot see eyes of my students. And so this way of exchanging the information right now is completely um, corrupted. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's very, very strange. And uh, right now internet became uh, as a new sense organ for for people and uh, yes, I understand it saves lives and uh, it's a barrier uh, against this uh, COVID. But um, you know, uh, communication is a core factor uh, of our living. So that's why I understood that the communication right now it's the main thing for everybody in the world. We are like on the grand ground zero of understanding that uh, internet is just a tool, and this is. And this is just a tool, that's all. We need physical things. Okay, but then when we spoke yesterday, at one point you said, but uh, we are afraid to touch things around us in the city, uh, to take a coffee in the academy, because who has touched the button of the coffee machine before us? Uh, so also this morning I, I heard a conversation about trust and about the, the anxiousness that is around us. Uh, with this COVID uh, virus. Yeah, actually, you're completely right. It's, it's became really scary sometimes to go out. I mean, in April, in May, it was really, really scared, scary to go out because you're afraid of everybody who can be infected. And you, are, you don't trust to anybody. You don't trust to any object. You don't trust to any person. You are uh, going out with sanitizer, with a mask, you know, like, like this. And so uh, it's... Um, 
it's a new challenge of understanding people because if you're wearing a mask uh, you cannot read lips and you you need to um, to use your ears like 1000 percent more than it was before when you were lose when you were reading lips you know for for example for me i'm a little bit deaf on my uh, right ear so i'm 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 reading lips you know uh, so um this trust became you know like the second core factor for me it's it's for me <laughs> okay and uh, what kind of solutions do you think we could develop uh, in in St Petersburg in Russia what are the uh, the designers thinking about or the government yes, speaking okay. about yeah um i was thinking about it um uh, there are two ways of uh, finding the solution of it the first one is to think about object you know uh, and to think about how we can operate this object i don't know with voice or maybe with gestures but the other thing is to uh, design completely new services completely new ways of or scenarios of our living you know of um, how we operate in our everyday life um I'm not very good in service design. Anne is very good, you know. She 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 is professional, so she can she can um, tell us more. But in product design, I can say that we need to find a balance between um, uh, between uh, this safety thing and um, um, that we are giving this safety to the third parties. You know that we that these uh, safety things can be abused by the government. I don't know or other companies like i don't know facebook or i don't know yes at the same time uh, yesterday we were speaking about the communication on zoom so uh, when people disappear be behind their camera because yeah. they switch off the camera so you have maybe some experience anna you want to speak about and how we can come out of this kind of a blackout uh, of who whom we are speaking with yeah precisely and Exactly like we spoke yesterday, now with the COVID situation, there were so many more opportunities than before to communicate with each other. I remember when the whole thing started, I was jumping on every online event ever just to see people. And I was attending, for example, some services and drinks in Berlin and other conferences that were before not accessible as such. But then I noticed again that, um, for example, working with different clients, um, not everyone turns on cameras. And then you have the situation exactly when you're trying to communicate, but the other people, they're not actively present. They are hiding behind the screens and they may be multitasking on the background and doing something else. So how do you interact with them? How do you capture their attention? And one thing we started to practice, of course, we were asking everyone politely, could you turn on your cameras? And that didn't work. And then we uh, started to engage more and more some interactive collaboration tools like Miro, for example, where people have to work on the same board together so they are actively engaged. So I guess it's a huge challenge of post-COVID world that we are now connected more because we need other people in isolation. But how do we establish communications in a way that people feel actively engaged? And like Joanne noticed a really interesting theme today, the active listening in the morning that was mentioned. So how do we design tools and methods and work practices that help people to be more actively engaged during a communication? That's a really interesting question. Yes, and uh, so there was the question that we thought if we need to be controlled all the time to make sure that we don't do things that are wrong, um, it's a bit frightening somehow. So we need to communicate, we need to, to keep, um, to do, we, we need to turn back to communication, even physical communication. But then if we are preventing that and we ask people to be one meter distance uh, and they are controlled because people in the street walk around with special machines to uh, understand if you have fever or you don't have fever, um, who will decide what you have to do, what you can do in the street uh, after COVID, and how will you be will we be able to communicate in the old way, or do we have to invent a new normal? As we hear all the time, speaking about this new normal, will it destroy our freedom? This new normal. Mackenzie, no. what do you think? Um, actually, I'm really happy that Saint Petersburg is really near to Finland. 
And we know that in Finland, um, you know, people are making jokes that, uh, you know, you need to stand 1.5 uh, meters from each other. It's very near for them. They said normally so we are like two or three meters. So uh, I think we have a completely new normal. It means that we will change our traditional way of communicating and we will stand alone, I don't know, not near like, like we did before in, for example, in Russia or in France or in Germany. We will make a bigger distance. So Finland for us right now, it's a big uh, example of how um, we can keep uh, our life uh, safe and, uh, and, and, and not fragile. <laughs> Yes, so no hugs. Just no hugs. Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this okay. is a really interesting issue that, Anna, you mentioned that um, communication about the COVID situation, it can create a feeling of control when you are measured and the temperature is monitored and so on. But at the same time, it can create trust. So what is this difference that makes one or the other? That when do we, for example, Russia, I guess, goes a bit more in the way of control and trying to, I don't know, we can't see, maybe you know the context better. I'm just judging from the media. Unfortunately, I'm locked away from my family by the borders at the moment. And at the same time, I feel that in Finland, we are gravitating a bit more towards trust. And one of the things that I felt that the government really did well here is that they established quite open communications, not just in terms of the data they provided, but also like being there every day for people and creating these briefings. And one of them was really touching. Uh, Finnish government, I think many governments did that, but they made a special governmental briefing for children, for kids, when all the ministers, the prime minister and all the ministers, they were answering questions like, when can I see my grandma again? Or how, how can I be not so afraid of the virus? And they were explaining in really, really simple terms that kids can understand. And I guess this level of openness, trust and showing up, uh, it creates some, some level of trust exactly in society that people are following the regulations and trying to distance and so on. So I felt that in Finland, there was quite a bit of open and trustful communication about the situation that helped us to get through this couple of months. Yes, I think we had some speeches about also the, the huge amount of data that were shown on television or in the newspaper and the difficulty to make sure that those data were represented in such a way that they were true once they were transferred into a diagram and that the, analy the, the analyze done by the specialist or by the graphic designer was also uh, correct and could give the real information to the public. Uh, we had, uh, in, a, in fact, uh, lots and lots of information also every day in Italy, for example, up to one point, and then they, they decided to do it once or twice a week. So it was like we were left alone for two days. Uh, we had to rely maybe on the newspapers or look for other kind of uh, information to, to be sure uh, of what we, we got. Um, and I think yesterday we also mentioned in our conversation before uh, we start we we met today, uh, we spoke about the biometrics uh, control and the facial the facial uh, control that are also put up um, as solutions in cities or companies. Uh, and you were explaining as well the difference between the use of coins and uh, uh, banknotes that now you don't have any more in, um, in, more or less in, in Finland, that you always use a credit card, a touchless, so you don't have the management of uh, physical products. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Finland is quite a bit on, con on this cashless pay payments these days. And I guess we were talking about this in the context of physical communication. And today in the morning, there was this really interesting talk about physical touch that I was listening to. And also I was thinking that, yeah, indeed, that physical communication also changes because of technology. And in the post-COVID world, um, having these cashless payments and even payments without any touch or like facial recognition and so on, biometrics, of course, it makes it a bit more safe to be in the public spaces versus when you have to um, touch everything by yourself, all the buttons and all the interfaces. But at the same time, like also you mentioned that 
how much we can rely that our privacy will not be violated when we use biometric data, especially now that recently IBM and several other companies, they decided to stop providing um, biometric services, facial recognition services. So this is a really interesting question. And Vikenti, what do you think about it? Uh, yeah, actually, you know, um, as a product designer, I'm also in, I was involved during uh, uh, April and May, and right now I'm still in, involved in few projects for the post-COVID world. So, for example, I'm, I'm, you, I was doing um, the the things for the for the masks. I was, I, I was developing uh, special cameras they can detect your temperature. So it's it's just like a surveillance camera on the street, and so it can detect how many meters you have between people and what is your temperature so if you have a high fever it will you will be de de detected as a uh, dangerous person and so uh, possibly that emergency will come to you and take you because you can be a i don't know infected person so um, right now i know that um, it's a big demand for these products and uh, um, i know that lots of companies in uh, in eastern europe right now is taking care about all these data um, um let's say service um, palaces i can say uh, because they understood that they will have a, a, a huge amount of data to take from all the streets to take from all the uh, houses so um um, you know, talking back like few minutes ago, we are like antipodes to to the Finland. We don't have any any information from our government. They just spoke maybe once or two times during these two months, and so we got this information only via WhatsApp, for example, the Telegram or Zoom sessions. So um, people uh, right now really prefer to pay only by cash. Oh, by by, by sorry, by by by. Uh, Cards by banknotes or, or yes. money? No, 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 no. By 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 cards. No, oh, by no, cards. no, no cash. Yeah, they're afraid of it. But actually, right now it's um, it's summer. People say, okay, there is nothing, nothing bad. <laughs> Everything is okay because it's 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 plus thirty one and it's okay. Yeah, we have the long nights of Saint Petersburg, but it yeah. <laughs> doesn't mean and that the virus crazy. is completely gone. Probably. So there is a there is a sort of contradiction on one on one side we we want to turn back to communication and to see people and to touch things and on the other side we are afraid of communicating physically yeah. and um, this is really a dichotomy uh, we will probably carry around us for a while and people some people might be much more anxious about this than than others uh, it will all depend also on how uh, the communication is done. Um, for example, in Italy, when I came in this uh, little village, uh, everyone had to wear gloves in the bars and in the shops. And but at one point they said, "But we don't have, we cannot buy gloves uh, anywhere. So uh, we prefer to wash our hands ten times rather than wear gloves that we have to reuse and we don't know how to wash them and so on." So at one point the government decided another thing, and then they they could take off the gloves and they wash their hands. 10 times if they need to write to to do it so um yes there is this uh this 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 fair uh, which is underground and it's a pity because as you say communication is needed we need to see the eyes to touch to hear uh, we have to avoid the screens that we always have uh, in front of us and and makes our as tired we also hear about zoom fatigue uh, and i yeah. think it's real <laughs> this uh, kind of this uh, zoom fatigue so yes how, but how could we find new solutions then to answer to this dichotomy and to this uh, two fa two faces of the same uh, of the same problem we we want to see each other we want to be in communication but not only through uh, digital. So yeah, how can the designers invent something? It's a great question. And in my opinion, um, I guess the, the one of the most important things is this mind shift. Um, if we if we can accept that from now on in the post COVID world, we will have to communicate remotely, especially following from the previous talk um, or, or discussion on the growth. 
it was a lot about that we cannot keep the pre-COVID lifestyle anyways. We cannot travel as much if we want to combat the climate change and so on. So we will have to do things remotely and talk to each other remotely and celebrate with families remotely. So I guess the first thing in creating any kind of solution is adopting this mind shift that yes, many people with whom I want to be connected, they will not be physically present in my life as much as I want. So after that, I guess we might want to um, discover some interesting solutions that how to create the same feeling of closeness, connectivity and sharing meaningful experiences while being remote. And this is a huge challenge. I'm not sure if anyone really tackled that um, in, in the everyday communications. I can just tell maybe from design perspective, what I've noticed in the recent years, months even, um, the widespread of tools which are remote collaboration first by default, such as Miro, Figma and others, which allow people to communicate really seamlessly on creating anything together. I think that's already a huge step forward that we can now um, do the design and readjust our design processes to remote work while being seamlessly connected with the help of these design tools. But then when we go beyond the domain of design, I think there's still like a huge room for research and different kinds of solutions to be tried out and tested. Vikenti, how did you work with the students now uh, in this period of time where you had this uh, virtual communication, but you have the exams on prototypes or um, did you work in labs? Um, our academy is closed for everybody. Um, maybe only administration can come there, but actually we're working only via Zoom. We are having sessions from the morning till the evening, really. And um, I'm really, really tired of Zoom because we have, I don't know, I'm, I spend nine hours a day just uh, just looking into the Zoom and talking to people, talking to students. And uh, right now we have exams. We have a diplomas in a few days. In six days, we will have diplomas. It will be our first experience with virtual diplomas. It will be a bachelor, master program for three days. And we even tried to, uh, we invited a few um, uh, jury members from France and from Finland, actually. And so uh, they wanted to come, but Russia is closed. So they will be, um, they will be with us via Zoom. So actually, I want to forget about Zoom really, <laughs> really shortly. But I understand it's 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 um, for maybe for the next year I will be I will be sitting with my phone with my uh, I don't know with my screen all these days of 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 the education and it's and it's very difficult for students actually you know because the community for students is very important when they're sitting together they're drawing they're sketching they're making some jokes maybe they're uh, collaborating a lot or maybe some of them can see what other doing. So right now they're completely separate. They're sitting in their rooms and um, the level of the, of the sketches of the ideas is not very high right now. And I can say that students who had very high potential grow really, really high. And students who, who was really, who was not really interested in design, they're slowing down really um how to say really deeply in their um um in their feelings that they don't like design anymore actually that's that's bad um, yeah it's very bad for me it's very bad because i wanted to make a community because we have in one group only nine to ten eleven persons so for me the uh, combining them and making them like a mixture of different ideas of exterior design, interior design, color and trim, or maybe conceptual design, advanced design. And right now they're completely uh, separated. And um, yeah, it's it's very, very frustrating for them. Yes, I can understand. Uh, I think many, many schools around the world have experienced the same uh, complexity yeah. of teaching and uh, some, some schools actually uh, closed by uh, early April, end of March, early April, uh, and uh, try to organize the final exhibition somehow, but uh, you miss uh, a big part of the um, of the work. Um, 
which is a which might be a real pity also for the students. But did you work also on the uh, on the theme of communication or on the uh, uh, on the interrogations that you had uh, in this period, or did you keep to the same kind of uh, to the same program that you had before? Did you see in also in the students the necessity to be more proactive towards the situation they were living in? Actually, uh, we were thinking about the uh, psychological things in their mind, so we kept uh, the themes from the from the February that we decided before, and so we still have it. But for the next year, yeah, we are thinking to uh, to rethink about all the program and uh, about all the themes um, because it's it's a new world, so we need uh, them to be uh, prepared to be um, to be active. So we will try them to uh, to make hypotheses, different uh, researches, and we are trying them to to think more in new circumstances. So I don't know, Anna, if you have some hopes that you want to uh, share for the future, uh, yeah, your maybe future I'll... as a designer. <laughs> Maybe I can give one example that uh, I think was quite successful in terms of um, COVID communications. So we were talking now a lot about these human connections and how difficult it is for students to be disengaged. And although we have many Zoom meetings and teams and hangouts and whatnot, it does not replace the same um, level of just, you know, like human connection when we just have a chat together. So at my workplace at Futurize, what we did we started to have this morning coffee slots. It's basically an um, online meeting, but without any predefined agenda. It runs every day from 9 to 9.30, and anyone from our design team can, can jump in. So when we feel like talking or just sharing the problems or just, you know, like asking each other how the day went and so on, we can use this morning coffees for this really, really human informal communication. So my hope maybe for the post-COVID world that is that we don't forget that meetings not necessarily need to be set for agendas and for something specific. They can be just chats or random exchange of thoughts. In our case, that did work pretty well. It did create this feeling of coherence and unity amongst the team. Yes, I think the inf we missed a little bit these informal meetings between the coffee break on the corridor uh, between two doors uh, because the communication uh, in a working place often passes through these little moments of informal meetings. And so, Vikanti, we have to close in two or one minute, no, two minutes. Uh, what is your hope for the future? Uh, my hope for the future? Um, actually, I don't have hope. <laughs> I'm working, you know, this moment I'm working, I know that all my students are okay, I know that my family is okay, and I'm trying to uh, to keep uh, my mind open to all the uh, processes around the world. So my hope right now is to live this moment, this life. Right now everything is okay. Um, I don't know, before I was making plans, right now I cannot make any plan because all the plans are ruined. And so the hope is um keep your mask and uh, wash your hands uh, what you can say and be with your family try to call them and to talk to your grandmother uh, to your children because right now my my daughter is really really happy because i'm working from home and she can see me she can play with me uh you know it, i know that my my daughter and my wife they're really happy because before i was working in the agency in the studio and also in the academy so I was not at home. I was only on weekend. Right now I'm with them. I'm with them. So they're happy, and I'm happy with them. So this is my hope. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. So I'm happy for you, and uh, I hope that you will find a balance for the future between being at home and being in the agency, uh, and that uh, you will keep on communication with all the old people. Uh, coming back to the thematic of uh, before um, on the, the growth and the caring uh, that uh, Graham uh, uh, finished his uh, conversation with, uh, taking care of the world, the planet, uh, not think only about the users, but think about a planet-centered design maybe, um, which is a theme I heard in a conference on Zoom. <laughs> but uh, yes, of course, um, we hope that the future will be uh, possible to plan somehow in near in a, in a near future. I think we have to close little by little this conversation. 
Um, I hope you will have a nice long evening uh, because you have light until 11, if not midnight. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, after the winter, I think it was really, uh, really nice. Okay, I thank you, Vikenti. I thank you, Anna. And I hope to see you maybe in Milan. Somehow, I really hope to see you too soon. Or Thanks in another so little event, maybe not a big event. Totally. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And, um,